Um, shall we start? Uh, so welcome all to this SIV uh, Virtual Computational Biology Seminar Series. Today we have the pleasure to uh, host Jérôme Goudet, uh, who is Associate Professor uh, in Population Genetics at the Department of Ecology and Evolution, University of Lausanne, and is also a group leader at the SIV, the Swiss Institute of Bioinformatics. So uh, Jérôme studied biology and uh, agronomy in Paris, in the University of Paris 7 and uh, Citoyen National Agronomique in France. He earned his PhD in 93 by studying the genetics of geographically structured population at the University of Wales in the UK. Then from 93 to 95, he pursu pursued his career with a postdoctoral training at the University of Lausanne, where he then became first assistant and in 96, maître d'enseignement et de recherche. He then uh, partly worked at the Institute of Ecology in Lausanne, at the University of Lausanne, and at the Genetic and Biometry uh, laboratory in Geneva. And in 2001, Jérôme obtained his tenure track, tra tra sorry, tenure track in population genetics at the Department of Ecology and Evolution here. And uh, for seven years, he also uh, was the vice head of the department. Um, and in, since 2004, he's associate professor uh, in uh, population genetics in the same department. And si since 2016, he's also the head of the master program called Behavior, Evolution, and Conservation. So the main focus of the group concerned the understanding of the, the interplay of population structure, traits, architecture, and selection. For this, the group member used different approaches from theory and the development of statistical tools to field observations. So the main biological models currently used in the group are the uh, barn owl and um, minopterus bats. On the theoretical side, they investigate the dynamics of multilocus genetic system under the influence of selection, migration, and breed. And they, de they develop comprehensive individual-based model as well as statistical methods to infer selection, mating systems, and population structure. So today, Jérôme will share with us his insight into past demography using, on one hand, today's barn owl and human genetic data and computer simulation. So thank you again, Jérôme, for accepting uh, our invitation, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation, and thank you to the audience, and thank you to the people online. Um, so uh, one thing that is perhaps a bit different from usual seminars is that uh, since there are people online, it is not recommended that we stop during the presentation. And so unless you have, uh, un unless there is something crucial that you don't understand because I completely cock up something, uh, just say and ask. Otherwise, we, if you can whistle the question until the end, that'll be great. Okay. So, yes, today what I want to talk about is um, how can we use genetic data to infer past demography? And when I'm talking about genetic data, I'm talking about today's genetic data. And I'm going to use two examples. Uh, one based on Barn Hall. I've got a now quite long-standing collaboration with Professor Roulin, Alexandre Roulin, uh, also in Lausanne. He's been, he's been following Barn Halls for 30 plus years. And uh, I came into the game a few uh, years ago, starting to, to look into it. And I will also use the uh, uh, treasure trove uh, of human genetic data available uh, to show you what we can do and what we cannot do with uh, inferring past demography using genetic data. So the question, can we infer the past demography of species based on today's genetic data? And I think the key point here is today. Today genetic data. Why? I mean, people interested in the past are historians, they look at books where things are recorded, or they look at bones, or they look at things trying to get stuff from the past. Here, we're not doing that at all. Although some people in the field is changing, some people are starting to use ancient DNA. But what we're going to talk about today is present day genetic data. How can this be used to understand the past? So why are we interested in such questions? Well, first of all, because the past demography is, is important to understand the past history of a species. Has it been small for a long time? Was it bottleneck? Has it been an expansion? 
uh, was a new range available and therefore it could colonize this new range? All these kind of questions are relevant to understand where the species are coming from and whether they might be on the way to speciation and to divide into different groups that cannot reproduce in the long term. So connected to it is who has been connected to who and how long ago? Has there been recent migration between populations or does it dates back? And again, this is related to the idea of speciation and how differentiated are groups of populations. We might also be interested in selective pressures exerted on population X or population Y. For instance, if the range open and suddenly a, a species go up in the mountain or get close to a, a new environment, what are the effects? What are the genomic changes that we can see there? And last, can the observed pattern at gene Z be due to selection? We see a pattern. It looks like it's not normal. It doesn't look like coming out by chance. But can we really say that? So these are the type of question that we might be interested in. And so uh, why today's genetic variants are relevant for these kind of questions. Indeed, there are today's genetic variants, so they can tell us something about what's going on today. But what's in it that tells us something about the past? OK? Well, for instance, we know that if you see an excess of very rare variants, single terms or double terms, alleles that are at a very low frequency, and the in excess of mean that we need to have a comparison. But if we see many of these rare variants, it is a signature that the population has been ex expanded recently. If we see if we see a high diversity in a population, many variation, much more than in other population, it is a signal that the population has been large and established for a long time. If we see large differences in annual frequencies between two sets of population, it means that there has been little exchange between this population. But all these are qualitative arguments, and this needs to be quantified. Okay? So how can we quantify this? Ideally, I take a pen, I write an equation, the frequency of my different variants is a function of the mutation rate, of the effective size of population here, of the effective size of population there, of how much migration there has been between these two populations, of uh, what was the ancestral population size, and all these parameters. Okay? Well, we're not there yet. Okay? We don't have that yet. Or at least we don't have that yet for complex demographic models involving several, many populations. Thus, what we do, and this is where the computational biology comes in, we resort to simulations. Okay? And so one way to do it is to obtain the likelihood of a given allele count as a function of all this. But this is quite time consuming and heavy. And the other way we can do things and do this is to use approximate Bayesian computation. Often when people hear the word Bayesian, half the room freaks and the other ones say, yeah, grand, Bayesians, okay? Well, you'll see in a minute that be behind approximate Bayesian computation, there is nothing very tricky, there is no complex mathematics or anything. We're just going to use computers, okay? Basically, in a nutshell, we have observations from or, sp or pet species. And this observation of genetic variants are due to a series of unknown parameters, those that I mentioned before. The mutation rates, the population size of the different populations, whether they grew in the past or whether they, they, they re reduced in the past, whether they were connected and they split into different things. All this will make the observed frequency today, but we don't know how to write the equation. Okay? So we have these observations, and from this we get summary statistics. What are summary statistics? Well, it could be simply the distribution of frequencies, but it could be some more 
derived statistics like the square of these frequencies, and this is the genetic diversity, or several variants of this. Okay? And we have this for observation. Then, we sit down, we think, and we think about where these species can be coming from. And we elaborate a model. So we elaborate a model, model mean we know the land, we have an idea about the past climate and these sort of things, and we're going to elaborate ideas about how populations were connected or not connected in the, in the past, how many there were, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay? So this is all Bayes model. And this Bayes model, we plug, plug it into computer simulations. We run some demography. So on this demography, we have the genetics. From this genetics, we obtain summary statistics. And we compare the summary statistics from the simulation to those of the observation. And we try to minimize the difference between them. OK? So initially, we're going to sample these statistics from a very large set of possibles. This is all prior for the different parameters. And by comparing the summary statistics to the observed summary statistics, we're going to reduce the possible range of viable parameters for all data. So the summary statistics are statistics obtained from the data set. The question is obviously which one should, be, should we use? And so um, the simplest one we can think about is the distribution of allele frequency, something known as a site frequency spectrum. Okay? And we have this either for the whole set of observation or for popul each population independently. And I'm not going to discuss this in length at length because Laurent Escoffier in a virtual seminar. Uh, I think one year ago, presented what he's been doing using the side frequency spectrum. Okay? Another way to tackle the issue is to take a large panel of summary statistics. So when I, when I say a large panel of summary statistics, what it could be? It could be the number of allele per locus, the distribution of the number of allele blockers. It could be the genetic diversity in each population. It could be the genetic distance between population. It could be all sorts of things. And I can generate, there are a huge range of population genetics have been very good at generating new estimates and new descriptors of genetic diversity. So we could use all of them and compare them from the observation and from the simulation. But when I say this, you already see that there is a problem here. The more statistics, statistics we're going to have, the more difficult it's going to match the two sets. We're moving into a more and more multidimensional space. Okay? So people have tended to rather using an exhaustive set to reduce this using some form of uh, multidimensional scale. Another approach, and one that I'm going to uh, focus on in the two examples I'm going to take, is to use a reduced expert-inspired set of statistics. Basically, the people recall, um, getting the data, they know their species, they know their statistics, they know what's going on, and they know which one should be relevant for the pattern they're seeking. Okay? And in the perspective, I will, I will discuss about another way to approach that. Okay? So let's move on to the first example. The first example is a bound hole, and so you have a picture here of two birds from one brood, and the striking thing that you see from this is that they're different color. From the same, same brood, we have white birds and we have dark birds. Okay? And this polymorphism is known across Europe. So this bird is, co is very cosmopolitan. You find it in Europe. You find it all over the world. Actually, it's one of the birds present in all the continents. And this color poly polymorphism is also present on almost all continents. Okay? 
not only do we see this color polymorphism, but the distribution of the color is not random. Across Europe, we see a climb of color from the southwest of Europe, from Portugal, to the northeast of Europe. Okay? And this is true for this color, so the dark, so the, 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 the brown and the white, but also for spottiness. Okay? And on the right hand side, you have maps of Europe. The left column is for uh, males, and the right column is for females. The top row is for redness, and the bottom row is for spottiness. Okay? But basically, what is striking through these four panels is that we see that as we move to the northeast of Europe, we get darker and darker birds and spottier and spottier birds. Okay? Why? We don't know. And Alexandre Roulin, who's been working on this for many, many years, has several hypotheses, but we don't know for sure why we have that. And so, an initial question, why do we have that, is could it be due to chance? Could chance have created this pattern? So, in order to find out about this, Sylvain Antoniazza and people from the group of uh, Alexandre went on and wrote to several people and traveled across Europe to sample birds. And so the different dots on the map represent sampling locations, and the numbers above represent the number of individual samples from these locations. Okay? And from these individuals, we have two things. We have feathers, and from feathers we can get blood and we can get DNA. And we also have, with a feather, we can get the color. The, the feather from the belly tell us something about the color of the bird. Okay? So we have 17 microsatellite loci. And today, in, when we talk about genomics data and uh, several billions markers, it's quite small. Uh, but still, with this kind of information, we might be able to get some, to know something about the past of the species. We had 20 populations across Europe and around 20 individuals per population. And if you're interested, you can uh, get this paper from Molecular Ecology where we describe uh, what is going on. And remember, I mentioned summary statistics. One key observation is that if you, so I'm going back here, Evora is the place here in Portugal. Okay? So on the x axis, I've got distance from Evora. I'm moving away from Portugal. And on the y axis, I've got the mean allelic richness per locus per population. Okay. How many variants I've got at each of these macrostellate loci? And we clearly see that as we move away from Evora, this mean number of ideal goes down. Okay. Similarly, we can look at genetic distance between population by a measure called FST, pairwise FST. And as population gets more and more distant geographically, we see that this genetic distance increases. Okay? So we could go on and say, well, okay, let's simulate this population and take allelic richness for each of the population and pairwise FST for all, each of these population. And this will make a very, very high dimensional data set. Rather than that, what we use is simply the slope and the intercept of the regression here, and the slope and the intercept of the regression here. Okay? The simulations were performed with Quantinemo 2. So Quantinemo is a program that was developed in my group by Samuel Neyeshwander. Um, and the way we used it is we run forward demography. So basically we start from a place and we let the population so in the 20,000 years ago, Europe was covered with an ice sheet, okay? And owls cannot survive when there is ice, okay? They need to have bare grounds to forage. So 
as the glacier retreated, there was territory left over for the owls. And what we did is we simulated the demography of the owls across Europe. And then the genetic was simulated backwards. Okay. So what we did compared to many ABC approaches is we had something that was that contained isolation by distance via a stepping stone migration. If you look at many of the papers using ABC, it's container simulation. Basically, you have a container for its population, and they exchange migrants, and they could grow in size. But there is nothing that mimics isolation by distance. Here, we have isolation by distance. And what we want to do is to ex estimate six demographic parameters, the local carrying, cap ca carrying capacity, how many individuals are living on each uh, spot, population growth rate, the size of the refugia, migration rate, mutation rate, and the start of colonization. OK. So uh, here you have a map of Europe. And we conjectured that there was a refugia in Spain, or in the Iberian Peninsula. And we simulated growth from Spain across Europe in a stepwise fashion. Okay? So on the first step, we let the population grow across Europe, colonizing France, and then England, and then the Central Europe, all the way to, uh, to Poland and the Balkans. Once we had done that, we saved all of this information with the migration rate, et cetera, into a database. And we then simulated the things backwards to get genetic data from this demographic, OK, using the coalescence. So this is one model. But obviously, there is a strong prior in saying that the refugia was only Spain. We know from other species that refugia could be based also in Greece, in Italy, and in other places. Okay? So we decided to go for a series of different models and choose which one and, and, find, to, and find out which one was the most likely. So we had models with one refugian in Iberia. And we also played with the notion that carrying capacity may not be constant across Europe. We might have larger carrying capacity in the south and, and smaller in the north. We might have um, extension rate as we move north, et cetera, et cetera. So we tested all of these different models. OK. We had models with two refugia, one in the Iberian Peninsula and one in Greece. And again, we had several uh, variants with climbing carrying capacity, with extension rates, and with different migration model. And then as a null model, we had one with, with no colonization, meaning that Europe was colonized from the start, and also meaning that there is no signature anymore in our data concerning the past. OK. The results are presented here. So here, we just compare the likelihoods of the different models, and we see that the one carrying capacity model with one refugia is the most likely, followed closely by, by the uh, carrying capacity decline and the other one refugia model. But really what this graph is showing is that the likelihoods of models with two refugia is very, very small. OK? So based on that, we picked this model here, the one carrying capacity, because it's the most likely and also the most parsimonious. And from that, we inferred the six demographic parameters we mentioned before. The carrying capacity of each patches, the population growth rate, the refugial population size, migration rate, mutation rate, and when did the colonization start. And the gray line corresponds to the prior distribution, and the black line corresponds to the posterior distribution. That is, the set of observations that fitted best with or observation. And you see that for some parameters, the prior and the posterior are quite similar. For instance, the population growth rate, we don't have much information. On the other hand, you see that for the mutation rate and for the start of colonization, we have quite a bit of information. OK? And if you look at the value of the parameter is estimated, and if you compare it to what is known about movements of birds, 
about population size of birds, etc. That fits pretty well. So, for instance, we have carrying capacity of 200 for square of 50 by 50, and this is something that corresponds to the density that bird watchers have been uh, finding. Migration rate was estimating, estimated to 37% between neighboring patches, and this corresponds to uh, the average distance between uh, birth and reproductive uh, place of uh, birds, etc. So this, this estimates make some sense. Okay, so now we have a demography. Okay, now we have a demography. We know, or we have an estimate of how Europe was colonized by the Banal. The next question is, could the pattern seen in color be due to natural processes? Okay, and so for that, what we're going to do is we're going to simulate again using the parameter we just estimated a neutral trait this time, corresponding to the color. And we're going to test several genetic ar architecture for this trait. And the goal is to see if we can see by chance as big a climb of frequency, and this is going to be quantified by something called PST, as the one in the observed data through simulations. And the results are presented on this panel here. So I'm going to walk you through the different steps. So on the top, the three bar plots correspond to a, a trait encoded by uh, codominant markers. And it could either be one locus and two allele, one locus with 50 alleles, or 25 loci with two alleles each, okay? So the, the architecture of the trait could be either encoded by a very major locus, one locus, two allele. In passing, we know that in all, the color is affected by one locus, MC1R, and this MC1R, the variation at MC1R account for 50% of the variation across Europe. So the idea of having a very major locus is not completely ridiculous, but there might be more variant, or there could be a polygenic architecture. And all these dots and this box plot represent the distribution of the difference between neutral markers and the trait in simulations. And the two vertical lines correspond to two limits so this is the value observed in the uh, in, in the real data set, the, the, the black line, okay? And you see that all the simulations, oops, sorry, all the simulations in these situations are both. Another type of architecture that might be more favorable to such a pattern emerging is if the color allele is recessive. If it is recessive, it means that individuals in the refugia who are white might have a high frequency of this, of this allele, but do not express it. And so there is a better chance for the allele to be caught and to, to, to advance. And we see again that when we have this scenario, none of the simulations give a value as high as the observed. And it is only when we force simulations in simulations that the, the front of the expansion contain a high frequency of the variant of the color allele, that we see that under a neutral scenario, we observe values that are as high as in the observed data. So this is a, a very extremely conservative scenario, and even in this case, it's only one or two simulations that show something as high as the observed. Okay, so the take home from this is that ABC needs to be, need not to be restricted to containers type simulations. We show that we, we, we were able to do it with a real geography. Few key, few key well-chosen summary statistics are sufficient to infer demography. 
and ABC can, sorry, ABC can help to identify traits under selection. One step that we haven't been able to, uh, to go f further is inferring the strengths of selection from this type of approach. How strong is the selection to allow uh, such a client to be in place? Okay, next example is human expansion. And the key question that I'm going to ask here, if you've read the literature, you in, in, 2000 and in the uh, years 2000, there was a paper uh, by uh, Rosenberg saying that humans were grouped into five to seven clusters, okay? Using a program called Structure, uh, very famous. And uh, the question I'm asking here is, can this clustering pattern be due to a simple expansion process, okay? So the data I'm going to use is the data on the uh, human uh, genetic diversity panel. We have this time 400 microsatellites. And again, we're going to use Quantinemo. We use both exhaustive summary statistics and, and uh, multivariate, uh, multidimensional scaling and pattern statistics. And for the pattern statistics, that will be the same as the one for the holes. Basically, the slope and the intercept of isolation by distance and the slope and the intercept of our equations. And the details can be found in this publication. So this is a projection map of the world. Um, the origin of expansion is well known to be East Africa. So we simulated forward in time expansion from East Africa across the world through uh, the uh, the peninsula here, so there is no passage here, and the world was colonized. And all the crosses correspond to the sample population in, this, in the uh, AGDP panel. And the framework of simulation is, um, again, we have real data and summary statistics. We, have, we will perform simulations, obtain summary statistics. We obtain a posterior estimate from the statistics. And from this, once we have this estimate, we will post sample and rerun some simulations to generate patterns, to generate genetic data. We obtain patterns from that, and we'll compare the real and the simulated data. Okay? So, first of all, the type of estimate we're getting, the time in years since the expansion, the start of the expansion, oops. The time in years since the start of the expansion was 130,000 years ago, and this is not completely out of uh, what other estimates have been giving. Uh, a population size per patch of close to 4,000 individuals, uh, an overall population size of 5 million individuals, a, a migration rate between the by population of 4%, etc. What I want you to have a look at is here, the results of the pattern statistics from simulations and from the observation. You see that you have a very good match. On, on the left hand side, you have the observation. On the right hand side, you have the simulations. Okay? And you see that the simulations allow to match very well the observation. This is not so surprising here because we use these very statistics to run the simulation. What would be more interesting is to use some completely different statistic. And the completely different statistic we're going to use is uh, admixture, an admixture analysis, whereby we're going to uh, try to assign proportion of genomes of individuals to different group or clusters. Okay? And so what you see here is for different number of clusters, two, three, or four, k equal two, k equal three, k equal four. On the left hand side each time you have the results of the simulations, and on the right hand side you have the results of the observation. Okay? And just looking at this different graph, you see a very good match between the observation and the simulations. Okay? So we have clusters emerging from a pure range expansion process. Okay? In the simulations, we have no selection, we don't have barrier to migration apart from the shape of the uh, land masses, okay? And through this, we are, seem we are able to recreate exactly the pattern we observe 
in a structure analysis. Okay. So, um, I've been talking about microsatellites. What an old part I am. Two days we have much larger data sets. We have genomic data, we have millions of markers. How can we scale up to genomic data and use realistic model? People have been doing ABC with genomic data, but with very small models. Two populations, presence of migration or not, but not with models with isolation by distance sensor. I think a key point is that we need to choose computationally cheap summary statistics. If we need to perform a lot of calculation on each simulation to obtain something, it will be just impossible to run ABC type uh, approaches. People have been looking at multi-population SFS, site frequency spectrum. They are useful. Laurent has shown that we can go up to uh, a hands or uh, perhaps uh, 10 population, so 10 SFS. Further than that, it's very difficult to go, okay? And so the question is, how can we simulate realistic population? So, um, I have a hint. And the hint is a statistic that I've been working on for since my PhD. It is called FST. FST is a way to quantify the distance between population, okay? And we show in a recent paper with my uh, colleague uh, Bruce Ware that this FST is a function of, is a simple function of matching probability, whether two alleles match or not, okay? It's something quite commonly seen in forensic. One nice feature of it is that it is a method of moment estimator, meaning that it is very straightforward to calculate. You don't need to run uh, simulations and uh, uh, it's not computer intensive. The picture here shows that we can work out an expectation from these, okay? So what you have, the solid lines represent the expectation and the dots represent the simulations, okay? So we can work out, given population size and migration, what will be the value of the overall FST, or the average value of population-specific FST. This can be calculated population by population. And you see that the fit is pretty good. Okay? And so the question that I have is, does this contain information about past demographic events? And I will illustrate it now with data from the Southern Genome Project. Okay? So what I did here is I took the Southern Genome data and I pulled all the individuals from Africa into one group, all of the individuals from uh, South Asia in brown into another group, all the individuals from Europe into a group, all the individuals from East Asia into a group. Okay? And then what I did is I calculated the population specific FST or the average FST, not over the whole data set, but per category of allele frequency, okay? So now what I'm looking at is FST not over the whole data set, but I'm taking the single terms and I'm calculating FST on the single terms. I'm looking at the double terms, I'm calculating FST on the double terms, et cetera, et cetera. And I obtain this type of curve, okay? So the red dashed line corresponds to the average worldwide FST. And you see that this average worldwide FST is rather insensitive to the allele frequency. It's constant more over, over the whole range. On the other hand, population-specific FST show a very different pattern. Africa shows that for low frequency, we have very negative population-specific FST. Sorry. It goes up thereafter and then comes down again for very high uh, frequency. And we see the almost reverse pattern for Europe, East Asia, and uh, South Asia. So the question now is can we exploit this? Is there here information about the past demography of the Africans, of the Europeans, of the South Asian, etc.? And at the toy example, I go back to my container 
simulations, and I consider two containers, Africa and South Asia. That's, and South Asia derived from Africa some years ago. And the different containers are linked by migration. Okay. I've been running simulation with that using the MS program. And I obtain estimates of the size of uh, South Asia to be 9,000 compared to Europe, uh, to Africa being 10,000. And this, this estimates are not completely miles away from what is observed using other techniques. And more to the point, what I show here is the same graph as before, where I have in black the observed population specific FST as a function of allele frequency, and in red, the results of simulations, of the best fitting simulations. And you see that the best fitting simulations fit pretty well at least the beginning of the curve with the real observation. Okay? And the point here, the key point, is that it is much easier to visualize something like that than to visualize multi-dimensional side frequency spectrum. For the two-dimensional, we can do a pairwise comparison with different colors, but in three-dimension and four-dimension, it's impossible to visualize. Here, we can visualize things, and we can see how close we are between the observation and the simulation. So, what remains to be done is to explore the statistical properties of this population-specific FST, to derive analytical expression for it, and to investigate the sensitivity, sensitivity, the sensitivity of this population-specific FST function of value frequency to different demographic parameters. What I mean by that is how long ago uh, was an expansion, how long ago did population split, how much migration there is between this population, etc. And if you're interested, I'm looking for a postdoc to work on this. And so I come to an end. Uh, I want to acknowledge the people from my group, in particular Samuel Nereshwunder, who developed uh, Continemo. Frédéric Michaud, who took over from Fabien, is now uh, working hard to get the version 2 out. Sylvain Antoniazza was working with the Barnall and did the Barnall uh, ABC simulations. Ricardo and Elsa uh, did the work on uh, human. And uh, Bruce Ware is my colleague uh, doing, uh, collaborating with me uh, on the population specific FST. And for funding, thank you uh, to Unil, Swiss NFS, and Vitalite. Thank you to you. <laughs>